Okay, I think we can start up again. Linda will join us shortly. And um, so, um, how many of you have now turned into Bayesians? <laughs> that weren't Bayesians before. <laughs> You're in the process of moving over. Yeah, you have to be convinced even more, right? All right, we'll give the uh, final argument, convincing argument to tip you over that threshold. So um, first of all, um, let's say that in the first two examples, we looked at path analyses. And uh, we had models that were um, uh, just identified or uh, saturated, as we might call them. That is, uh, all of the paths were included. So uh, there was no uh, ability to test the model to fit to the data. Right? You had all of the paths in the model. Now we're going to switch to models where you don't have all of the paths in the model. We're going to have some fixed at zero. And we are going to take a look at a way to test the model with the help of uh, posterior predictive checking. And this is a, um, a, an approach that um, has been developed sort of like an add-on to Bayesian analysis. And I, th I think it's really a useful idea, a general idea that can be used um, for uh, the, the thinking is, is general, can be used even in maximum likelihood, I would say. So let's see what it is. We're going to work our way towards a p-value, which, which is really a frequentist concept. So this is sort of... Uh, trying to bridge the gap between frequencies and Bayesian thinking. So we're going to have a posterior predictive uh, p-value. And um, we are going to choose a very specific kind of posterior predictive checking. Posterior predictive checking is a general concept, but we're going to use a very specific version of it for our purposes. We're going to be uh, concerned with a fit statistic that we call f which is based on the usual chi-square test of uh, your model against an unrestricted model, H0 against H0, against H1, rather. And you may think of that, then, in terms of, um, say, uh, as Linda will talk about shortly, a confirmatory factor analysis model, so a covariance structure model. So H1 is the unrestricted covariance matrix or unrestricted correlation matrix. And we do the usual uh, chi-square test uh, that is... Um, computing the likelihood under uh, H0 versus against H1. Now, um, likelihood sounds like we're doing maximum likelihood, but we're only uh, doing that in the uh, testing phase as follows. So we're going to let low PPP indicate poor fits. Uh, here's how we compute the uh, test statistic, F. Uh, first of all, we compute it for the data using the parameter values at iteration. This is iteration specific, these computations. So this is at a certain iteration, say iteration 2000, we compute this standard fit statistic that we're used to from, say, CFA. But we're also going to generate a new data set, Y star, which is synthetic, artificial, replicated, it's, it's data that are generated of the same size as the original data using the parameter values at that iteration i and compute the same uh, fit statistics, the same likelihood ratio test for these replicated data. So we generate data from the model and the parameter values at the iteration i, but it's not the observed data. It's the fake data or the uh, synthetic data whereas f for y is the, the real data uh, chi-square test or likelihood ratio test uh, at the iteration i, all right? So we do that for every iteration among the iterations after the um, burn-in line. And we then approximate the posterior predicted p-value by the proportion of iterations where the observed real data chi-square test value 
or test value, we should say, when the real data test value is less than the replicated data test value. You know, we want it to be uh, the test value to be small, to fall in a, to be small relative to the generated data uh, uh, test values. Because if it was large, that would mean that uh, it would not be typical of data that you generate from that model, right? Now, that's a general idea. You can use any kind of uh, F value. It doesn't have to be the overall chi-square test. You could look at, say you have a uh, intervention study, you could look at the mean difference between the control and the treatment group at the last time point. If you want to fit that particularly well, well, look at the observed data mean difference, and then look at generated data, data generated from your model, and then compare the two. Does the real data look extreme compared to the generated data? If so, it probably wasn't uh, obtained from this model. So that's smart thinking, I, I think, and it's written by uh, Gelman, Stern, and Rubin, and all of these um, advanced Bayesians. So uh, M plus computes the PPP, uh, for every 10th iteration, so we skip some, does some automatic thinning among the iterations used to describe the posterior distribution of the parameters. And you even produce, so you get a p-value and you even get a 95% uh, confidence interval, and here it is, uh, we use, patients use that term for the PPC, in the PPC context, is produced for the difference in chi-square for the real and replicated data. And you don't want that difference to be large. So you, you want a negative lower limit. So you, for this interval, you want the lower limit to be negative and the upper limit to be positive. And I've found when I work with this, I really like this actually, as compared to chi-square test in the maximum likelihood estimation. Because you get, um, you, you see, you have a, start with a bad model and you have the confidence interval, here's zero, and you have the confidence interval sitting here and you modify the model and the upper and lower limit starts marching towards this and finally you hit the good model and the, it bridges zero, so the lower limit is negative. So you can see it marching on very nicely. And um, it, it remains to be seen how it compares to uh, maximum likelihood chi-square and to uh, uh, com com uh, other fit indices like the RMSCA and the CFI. I think uh, this can open up a whole uh, college industry of simulation studies. We have done some of them already just to know that we're not misleading you totally, only a little bit. Uh, and that's in that uh, 2010B Asparoho Mutian paper, some simulations. And I'm doing now more as well. And actually, uh, uh, as we, you will find in the writings, um, there seems to be a, less of the oversensitivity of the chi-square to large tests, to the large samples. In the covariance structure modeling, a chi-square tends to be a little uh, uh, jittery when you have uh, large samples, so it reacts to very small uh, model misspecifications. Not so with the posterior predictive checking, it seems. All right. So um, you get then, uh, you can get a histogram of this. Here's a poorly fitting model histogram where the difference between the real data and the generated data, zero, sits far out in the tail when that, so put it simply, when the vertical line sits out in the tail, the model is no good. When the vertical line sits more centrally in the distribution of generated data fit statistics, like here, the model fits well. And if you look at Bayesian books, they also do a bivariate plot between the observed and the generated data. And when you have many points in the, this uh, part of the plot above the line, the model fits well. So you can have nice graphics there showing you start with a bad fitting model where this scatter is down here and then it starts moving up there. So anyway, bad model, good model. Okay, we'll try to keep it simple here. We can say more about this, but um, let's not um, stay with technicalities too long. The deviance information criterion comes out of the British um, bugs and wind bugs tradition, 
And um, there's a lot of writing that goes together with that bugs or win bugs program. Uh, big uh, group uh, that developed the program with uh, state support, the governmental support in England. And people like uh, David Sp Spiegelhalter and uh, Nikki Best and many others have contributed nice stuff to it. And they have something that corresponds to BIC. BIC is a maximum likelihood concept. You know, you have likelihood, you have parameters. You have, but since you have a likelihood, it is maximum likelihood. Is there something corresponding to that in base? Yes, there is the DIC. And however, it, uh, the uh, original article by Spiegelhalter, I think in 1992, you have it in the reference list at the, at the end, had a discussion section, so not all, uh, not every Bayesian even is universally in favor of it. But it seems to be working uh, all right in the sense that better fitting models have lower D. So it seems to be useful. I, I'm not going to get into the details of it, mostly because I don't know them. But so I'll turn over to Linda, I think. Yes. And another example that maybe will turn you into a basin. <laughs> OK, so now we're going to look at a factor analysis example. We're going to look at the Halsinger Swineford data, which those of you who've come to other classes, we've looked at a lot, in, especially in topics one and two. And in this, we're looking at all 19 tests that are hypothesized to measure spatial, verbal, speed, and memory abilities. And it's a very small sample. That's one of the reasons we're looking at it. N equals 145. And um, banked expands on this in the technical report on the website, Bayesian analysis in M plus, a brief introduction. So let me uh, put the picture over here so we have that. So here's our path diagram. You can see the four factors, spatial, verbal, speed, and memory, the 19 items here. Now here's the factor loading pattern matrix. So an X represents that the factor loading is going to be estimated, and zeros represent that they're fixed at zero, the factor loadings. So you can see that um, visual cubes, paper, and flags for spatial are going to be estimated, and paragraph, sentence, word, and the word, two word um, items are going to be estimated for verbal, et cetera. Every factor loading uh, that's fixed at zero um, will not be estimated. So you can see that we're estimating uh, four, and then five here, and then another four, and another six. So those are the estimated val the values that we're going to be estimating. The x's, all the rest are fixed at zero. So this is a simple structure CFA model that we're looking at, with lots and lots of zero factor loadings. That's going to be the key. Whoops. All right, so now when we did a confirmatory factor maximum, let's talk about maximum likelihood estimation for this model. With confirmatory factor analysis, we rejected the model. The chi-square had a p-value of 0 0.0002, CFI 0 0.93, RMSEA 0.057, SRMR 0.063. So we did the analysis, and model fit was found to be poor. So we took a look at modification indices, and we saw that it pointed to three possible cross-loadings. Now, a cross-loading would be a, a loading over here of zero, where although visual is supposed to load on spatial, perhaps we would al allow it to load also on verbal. So having an X in this column would be a cross-loading, an X in the verbal column up there. So we saw that there were three major cross-loadings and using modification indices, but even when we freed those three, we still obtained poor fit. So then staying in the maximum likelihood of framework, we did an EFA. So we, and using four factors and using the oblique geomin rotation, and here we found good fit be, uh, with a p-value for the chi-square of 0.248, CFI 
CFI 0.99, RMSEA 0.025, SRM 0.030. So, um, and, but what we found is that the pattern of major loadings was just as we found over here. So the major factor loadings for each factor were the Xs, but we did find some cross loadings that were significant also. We had several significant cross loadings. So we have you know, ML with CFA and EFA. Poor fitting with CFA, well fitting with EFA, because in EFA, there, we don't fix all the factor loadings to zero like this. They're estimated. So just summarizing here, you know, as I said, the cross loadings were fixed at zero, model rejected in CFA. And what a more realistic hypothesis would be would be small cross loadings be allowed. Because we know that we're estimating small cross loadings, and if we could allow those, it would be a much more realistic depiction of the, the for the data. But we, really, we can't do that in maximum likelihood, because if we allowed all the cross loadings, then the model would not be identified. So you know, we are in a problem situation. But we have an alternative when we look at Bayesian analysis. And what we can do is, in Bayesian CFA is we can use informative cross loading priors. So for all the zeros in the um, table, we can give priors for those, in, informative priors for the cross loadings. And that means that, well, and we'll see this, but 95% of the priors are going to be in the range of minus 2 to plus 2. That I'll go over shortly. So anyway, so this, so it's an alternative. With maximum likelihood, we have CFA, we have ESAM, or EFA, and we also have ESAM now. But with Bayesian analysis, we have the ability to estimate the CFA model putting uh, informative priors on the zero cross loadings of the maximum likelihood CFA model. So I, I think this is pretty exciting, actually. <laughs> I have to confess. I haven't been ex excited for a while about some of these things, but this, was, this is pretty good. So let's, let's see what happens. So we have our CFA with small cross loadings not rejected by Bayes because we have the PPC of 0.353, whereas doing the conventional CFA, not in maximum likelihood now like we did before, but even doing the conventional CFA in using Bayesian analysis, we have a PPC that does not indicate a good fit. So we'd, we'd reject the model, the CFA model, using Bayesian analysis with a P of 0 0.006. And however, the small cross-loading model is not rejected. So that is good news. All right. So this is a repetition, really, of what I've been saying. And um, so what is the Bayesian approach? So it's less strict than CFA, but it's more strict than EFA. So it's an in-between model that, can't, that can only be done in the Bayesian framework. And we, there's a type of Bayesian modification index, at least that's what Bank decided he was gonna, how he was going to think of it. Because when you have these informative, small informative priors on the cross loadings, you're going to obtain estimates. And you can think of them as modification indices, because they're more or less telling you what the parameter would be estimated at. But it's not telling you one parameter at a time. It's telling you for a full set of parameters. So it, they're better in, than modification indices in that way, because when you look at a modification index, you, if you decide to modify the model using the modification index, you need to rerun the analysis to see how that changes other modification indices. So this has that uh, as an advantage also. So let's take a look at the input. Now, what we decided to do, or I, I should actually say what Bank decided to do, since he did it, is to standardize these 
all of the items. They're all in different scales. The model, the CFA model we're estimating is a scale-free model, so it's okay to standardize. So we simply divided each variable by the sta its standard deviation, so the square root of the variance here. And just to put it in an EFA metric also. So that's the first part of the input. And then I'll put the second part over here. And so here we have it. We have estimator equals Bayes. And here we're using the FB iteration option and saying that we want it to go at least 10,000 iterations, or we want it to go 10,000 iterations. And then in this part of the model command, we're giving the CFA model. So spatial, verbal, speed, memory. So those are the four factors. And we're using the by option to say that they're measured by the items following by. You note that we have asterisk as after the first variable in each list after by. And that, by default, those factor loadings are fixed at one to set the metric of the factor, but we're freeing them. And instead, we're setting the metric of the factor by fixing the factor variances at one. And that is specified by spatial dash memory, so that spatial verbal speed memory at one. So this is an EFA type metric then when we take that in combination with the standardization on the right screen. So this is our CFA. The bottom here is showing our, the modeling of the cross loadings for which we're going to give informative priors. So we say spatial by, and then we give all of the variable names that um, do not, are not part of the list up here, basically. And then we label them. So we're, the cross loadings for spatial, verbal, and then verbal speed, speed, memory, we had to break it up. They're all being given labels, A1 through A15. So everything that was a zero in the picture we looked at is being given a label. B1 through B4, B5 through B14, et cetera. And we're labeling them so we can give them informative priors in model priors. So here's our new model priors command. So you can see that we're, the way that you do it is you give the labels and then you give the little tilde, so distributed normally. N is for normal, with a mean of zero and a variance of 0.01. And I mentioned that, and we do that for all of them. So we're giving informed priors for all of the cross loadings, mean zero, variance 0.01. So, so the standard deviation would be 0.1. So we know that between zero and 0.2, zero and minus 0.2, 95% of the estimates will lie between those two values, between minus two and plus two. So that's a very small range. So that's just a little bit of wiggle room to, when we estimate the model for those cross loadings. And when we do that, whoops, we get the well-fitting model that we showed earlier where we did not reject. So we do not reject this model. And we receive parameter estimates for all of the cross loadings, which we can look at and see you know, their size and determine whether or not you know, we want to have them not be zero. So do you have anything else to say? I'll add a few things. OK. Well, I'm impressed. <laughs> that was good. You didn't know this topic two weeks ago? No. <laughs> All right. Okay, so um, two, two comments here. One is um, maybe you should go back a little bit. Here on slide 57, 
you do uh, this analysis that Linda showed you. That is really uh, the first step of the analysis. And in the paper that she referred to, there are, uh, there's at least one more step. So focusing on the last point, now you will get, with these informative priors for the cross-loadings, you will get estimates for those cross-loadings. For all of those cross-loadings, are going to be an estimate. Some of those are going to be what frequentists think of as significant. That is, their, their credibility intervals will not span zero. And it turns out in this example, and I've gone through several examples now, that there were particularly there were three cross loadings where the credibility interval did not span zero, so they were in a frequency thinking significant. Those were the three cross loadings that were also uh, the flagged by the ML modification indices. So I took a second step in the Bayesian analysis and freed those cross loadings. That is, I moved them out of the informative prior set and into the diffused non-informative prior set, freely estimating them. Whereas I held the other cross loadings still at their informative prior status. Only then, uh, so, so, okay, freeing only Backing up, so you can do two things. You can do that, and you find that the model will fit better, even better, have a better p-value than what Linda said for this model. You could also ask yourself, if I only freed those uh, cross loadings that were indicated by the Bayesian analysis, and got rid of the rest of the uh, cross loadings that were given informative priors, fix them at exactly zero, would, I, would that be sufficient? And the answer is no. No. Just like in line with the ML, when you freed those three cross-loading flag by the modification indices, the model did not fit well enough by the chi-square p-value, even at this relatively low sample size of 145. So even when you free those uh, cross-loadings, there were three, uh, did you have to still have uh, informative cross-loading priors on the other cross-loadings. And I would think that's often the case. And therefore, I, I think we see a new, I may be wrong, but we see a new type of uh, factor analysis here where you can put in informative cross-loadings to have a uh, more realistic hypothesis, less strict than conventional CFA, but we're saying more than EFA. EFA just says that we have four factors, but we, say, we can say much more about the, the, our hypothesis than that. We can say we have four factors, and we believe that the major loadings are in this position, according to the simple structure. We think that, by and large, the other loadings are small, but we're not naive enough to think that they're exactly zero for reasons of wording uh, and um, a skill solving a test well getting a high score on a certain item is not driven just by the hypothesized factor, but by some other minor factors. For instance, if you're going to uh, study um, memory ability, memory items tend to be influenced by a speed ability, the speed factor. It's not going to be a big influence, but it's certainly not exactly zero. So I think we're on to something that's much more realistic, matches the real substantive reasoning much better than CFA does. So we'll see. We'll see what others think, what you think. Are you sold? I see some nodding. So, and the other point was about this. <clears throat> How do we know what we should choose here? 0.01, or should it be 0.001, or should it be 0.05, or should it be 0.1? So I, I went through that then, and uh, you can study that in two ways. One is, which gives the best, for first of all, you can say, I'm going to go with 0.01 because I, I regard plus minus, from minus 0.2 to plus 0.2 as the range that I can accept the cross loading to be. It's, if it's bigger, if it's likely to have, if the prior contains 0.3 with a high probability, then there's something wrong with my measurement instrument and my hypothesis is off. 
but point two in the extremes I can accept. Well, then that, that decides for you uh, what, the, uh, what the variance should be here. You, I mean, changing the variance point of one to point of four, for instance, point of five, I think brings up the limit from point two, plus minus point two to plus minus point four, point 44, I think it is. You can compute it easily by hand. Another way you can do it is empirically, which, which variant, and they, this may be a no-no, but you know, <laughs> we're gonna do it, so let's talk about it. Uh, it's like sex education, I guess. <laughs> Third day. Uh, <laughs> that is point, if you, if you change that, you're gonna see that the PPP changes. That is, the p-value is gonna change, and the DIC is gonna change as well. And Actually, uh, for these data, I think the, the uh, maximum uh, DIC value was for 0.01, but the maximum fit, you could get an even better p-value for a, a variance of 0.05. But I didn't want to go to 0.05 because I, that would say that my prior was from minus 0.44 to plus 0.44 in the cross-loading, and that's too much. So I'm sacrificing a little bit of p-value for a more honest approach. But, you know, I'm just trying to sound like I'm a good doer. <laughs> so let's leave that alone then and go on to something else. But that's how you can think about these priors. They can become, you know, not just an uh, artificial concept, but something real that corresponds to how you think about your modeling. Okay, now you, some of you may not be convinced yet about the virtual Bayesian analysis, so now I'm going to hit you between the eyes here and say that we are going to do things that ML cannot do. And we're going to do it in a Bayesian context even when you have totally non-informative priors. It's only a computing device. Only a, you can think of it almost like an algorithm. It's not an algorithm to get exactly ML estimates, but to get uh, statistically um, the same estimates. Look at this model. You may not see it, but this is a model for uh, Nick's data. That woke him up. <laughs> uh, this is uh, two time points. This is Baltimore Public School data from uh, cohort three, as we call it. That means it's Nick's. Uh, and uh, it is from uh, two time points. This is fall of first grade. This is spring of first grade. Uh, although I may misremember it, and maybe it's fall of first grade and spring of third grade. It doesn't matter. But we are going uh, to talk about this measurement instrument, which um, is familiar to you. So I'll put it up like this instead. Uh, so these boxes here at the top correspond to the um, so-called TOCA instrument for measuring uh, aggression, aggressive disruptive behavior in the classroom as rated by the teacher. In this case, looking at 13 items of that measurement instrument, stubborn breaks rules, et cetera, down to loose temper. And preliminary factor analysis of those data for grades one and grade three seem to point to uh, uh, not one, but three dimensions underlying uh, the uh, aggressive disruptive responses. One has to do with verbal um, uh, aggressive behavior, uh, illustrated by stubbornness, yelling at others, lying, talking back to adults, and loses temper. And then we have the person-related aggression, which is uh, harms others and property, fights, and fights with classmates. And the property-related aggression breaks things, takes others' properties, harms property. So you could work with three factors, and um, they are, uh, you have the, this is from an EFA actually of these data. You have the factor correlations here uh, at within the, uh, time, within grade one, within grade three, and the across uh, correlations. I'm not gonna look at those right now in detail. But you have, uh, the idea here is that you have items that are quite um, skewed, and um, the distribution is quite skewed. Uh, many of the responses are going to be in the low category of not exhibiting this kind of behavior. And you can treat those kinds of items not necessarily as uh, continuous, but rather as uh, ordered polydomous or perhaps even dichotomized. 
In either case, then you end up with a categorical variable. So the boxes here, back to the top left of 62, the boxes here correspond to the 13 items. And uh, I think I ended up treating them as dichotomized at grade one and at grade three. And the factors, there are three factors then at grade one, three factors at grade three. And the uh, factor status at grade one influences the factor status at grade three. And then we throw in some um, covariates back here, uh, demographics for the, uh, for the students, for the children, influencing uh, their factor scores at both grade one and at grade three. So it looks like a fairly um, straightforward model, right? It's a structural equation model, and uh, it's something that we, we may want to be interested in estimating. The only thing is that it's very hard to estimate by maximum likelihood. We have uh, six factors here, six continuous latent variables that influence uh, 2 times 13, 26 categorical variables. We will have six dimensions of integration. Very heavy, very heavy. And then you say, well, categorical and con con categorical observed continuous latent, how about doing that with weighted least squares? Well, that's not great because weighted least squares does not, prop does not properly take into account that we have attrition. It's missing data in grade three. And missing data may be related to the behavior at grade one. So missing data may be only fulfilling the MAR assumption and uh, the weighted least squares estimator doesn't handle MAR. And we'll talk more about that after lunch, uh, fixing that with multiple imputation. But for now, we'll say weighted least squares cannot be used, maximum likelihood cannot be used, but base can be used quite easily. And I did that. So the computational issue is that maximum likelihood Slide 65 with categorical indicators requires numerical integration with six dimensions, which is not feasible because of computing time, computer memory, numerical precision. Computational time grows exponentially with the number of continuous latent variables, whereas with base, it's feasible because computational time grows linearly with the number of continuous latent variables, not exponentially. And in fact, this data I think their uh, sample size is about 600 here, if I remember correctly. Uh, I may be wrong, I can check that. Hopkins aggression study, convergence after seven minutes using two processors and the M plus default of two Markov chain Monte Carlo chains converting in 30,000 iterations. Seven minutes. Instead of, instead of trying to suffer through six dimensions of ML, which may not even fit in your computer memory, at least not if you have a large sample, and uh, will uh, require too much, uh, well, also too much memory because you have 15 times 15 times 15, six times um, uh, integration points, and uh, it will take up so much memory that it may not be feasible for you, and certainly it will take computing time that is a matter of uh, days rather than seven minutes. And um, the statistical issues then here are uh, measurement invariance across time, which is easy to handle then in, in, uh, in base, just like it is in ML. You can have no invariance of the measurement instrument across time. You can have configural uh, invariance. So the zeros uh, for the factor loadings are in the same place at the two, two, uh, two time points. You can have factor loading equality across time, which means that you're able to place the factors on the same scale at the two time points, or a fuller measurement invariance by, by requiring that the measurement intercepts for the factor indicators are also equal across time, which in principle then makes it possible to study factor mean changes across time, and also uh, making it possible to do growth studies. So in this analysis, I chose uh, three factor loadings equal, and you have the input here. Uh, it's it's uh, not dramatic at all. It's very familiar to those of you who have done multiple indicator modeling or SCM. Estimator base is the only new thing, really. So I'm not going to talk about it much, except to say that the factor model that I specified 
is uh, if you look at it carefully and count the number of parameters, <coughs> it is uh, an EFA within a CFA framework like we teach in topic one. That is, I'm only, in, while doing this CFA measurement model on the left, I'm only imposing the minimum number of restriction, you know, the M square restrictions necessary to identify the model, which is the same number of restriction that an EFA would assume. So I'm doing that by hand, so to speak, uh, by fixing only uh, the necessary number of zeros in the factor loading matrix. And then ultimately we do the factors, all of these six factors regressed on uh, ethnicity, uh, poverty status, and um, uh, gender. I'm not going to talk about the results, but uh, just show you that that model is feasible now. And uh, this is using two processors, and when I get my new computer, it's going to probably go down to uh, like three minutes. Uh, does it fit? Well, here we have PPP, the uh, zero predicted uh, p-value. And the confidence interval uh, spans zero, which we wanted. And the p-value is 0 0.324, 0.324. So uh, we would say that the data, the model could have generated the data. There's no evidence against that from the PPP. However, you should note that uh, our technical reports on the website point out that it looks like with categorical outcomes, the um, uh, power of this uh, procedure predictive checking with categorical outcomes, the power is uh, uh, weak. So we may uh, not have enough power to uh, reject the notion that the data could have resulted from this model. Power is okay for continuous, but it seems to be, the way we're doing it currently in M plus, uh, it seems to be weak for um, the categorical outcome. So with categorical outcomes, just technically, uh, it is uh, testing, doing the likelihood ratio test for the mean and covariance structure for underlying continuous latent response variables here. And it seems like we lose some power. But at least we can get the point estimates and get the um, standard errors. And we can explore, of course, if the model fits well as usual by looking at neighboring models, other alternative models. Now, um, here is another slide, another illustration of um, computational advantage of base versus ML, and I'll hand over the baton to <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, and I think I should just say, say one thing before we go on. I think you'll agree with this. We're not uh, advocating that everyone start using Bayesian analysis alone. And, and as it, we're just presenting it as an alternative for models that may not be easily estimated using maximum likelihood or weighted least squares. So it's just another tool in your to toolbox. It's not a tool to replace the tools you already have. So to add to that, actually, for models where you can do both ML and base, you could s do both analyses and see uh, do they differ in any uh, important way substantively. If base and ML disagrees about a substantively important parameter, well, then you know that if uh, somebody else tried to replicate your study, that finding may not be stable enough. You don't want base and ML to disagree, I would think at least not uh, based with the non-informative priors. So you can do both. Okay. All right, so this is a, a growth model with nine categorical indicators per time point. So nine categorical indicators per time point with eight time points. So 72 categorical indicators. So, um, this, and you can see that we then have a growth model down at the bottom on these eight factors. With maximum likelihood estimation, this model has eight dimensions of integration. And as most of you probably know who have tried any model with three or four dimensions of integration, you probably run out of memory and get that message and you know, find out when you email support that it's really not a feasible model to estimate using maximum likelihood estimation. And you would have to make some type of adjustment and change your model. So here we're proposing uh, Bayesian estimation 
for this model that would have eight dimensions of integration under maximum likelihood. So, and in this situation, in the ex example that Banks showed earlier, he had factor loadings invariant, but he did not have thresholds invariant. But because we're looking at a growth model, we're going to have thresholds also invariant across time. And uh, the input for this is uh, uh, prob very familiar probably to those of you who've been to other courses. So here we just have the title and et cetera. And here we start the model command where you can see by the labels one through eight that we're holding factor loadings equal over time except for the first factor indicator which is fixed at zero for each one. And here, once again, factor loadings are being held equal over time. Now, in the square brackets, we're refer referring to the thresholds of the variables with the dollar sign one uh, notation. And you can see we're holding the thresholds equal over time by the 11, 12, 13, and 14 parameter labels. And that continues on here. And then you can see that the factor intercepts are being held, or the factor means intercepts, rather, are being fixed at zero. And that's part of the specification of the growth model, which is specified with using the bar statement that we've been looking at. And we regress the growth factors on male in this input, but that doesn't show in the picture. So that's the input. And basically, the test of fit would indicate um, that this model doesn't replicate the data well. We don't have zero in the confidence interval, and we have a very small posterior predictive p-value, which Banked mentioned is often the case for categorical outcomes. And one of the reasons that this model probably doesn't fit the data well is because we took the nine items to be unidimensional, and most in, it is most likely that those nine items aren't unidimensional. In fact, we know they're not unidimensional. But we did this just simply for um, purposes of showing you this. I wanted to show you, whoops, I'm going the wrong way, one other thing to go back to the analysis, just to point to the analysis command. Once again, again, here we have the FB iteration option, and we've specified 20,000 iterations for that. And that means that we'll need to check tech 8 to determine whether or not convergence was met. And I think that's it for that example. OK, so we did um, path analysis, and we did um, factor analysis, and we did growth modeling. And what usually is next in turn, then, in the M plus order of things, is um, mixture modeling. So. Uh, Let's, let's talk about a mixture model that has um, a, a growth model on top of it. So if you look at slide 83, you have uh, continuous outcomes, y1 through y4, and an x variable. And you have two latent classes in a mixture model. The estimator is base, however. Excuse me, and we are going to uh, look at an analysis with only one chain for reasons that will become clear shortly. So we uh, are avoiding the default of two chains and looking at one chain, and we do a fixed number of base iterations. And the growth mixture model is specified by a, a linear growth, and the growth factor intercept and slope are regressed on x. And by default, then, in, since we have two classes in the mixture, M plus allows the means of I and S to vary across the classes, whereas all other parameters are held equal across the classes as the default. Here is what uh, the trace looks like. And what do you think of that?
There's something mysterious going on there. It almost looks like a northern light or something. <laughs> so is it poor mixing? Is it high autocorrelation? Or what is it? Well, you can peek ahead, so you know what it is, don't you? It is the dreaded mixture feature of, um, of a base called label switching. Label switching. <clears throat> uh, in, in Bayesian analysis of mixtures, you have extra difficulties. And actually, that was one of the reasons we held back a little bit on introducing base in M+, plus, that the mixture uh, situation didn't seem to be well covered in, in the Bayesian setting. What you ha have here, if you look at the y-axis, uh, you have uh, posterior values here to the right of the line that hover around one, and another set of posterior values that hover around three. And what happens over the iterations here is that the uh, MCMC algorithm switches between um, calling class one the high class and calling class one the low class. And you know, it doesn't matter which one is, if one is high or one is low, it has the same interpretation. It's just a, an ordering of the classes. It's a label switching, totally trivial matter. But if you look at the posterior then, it would look like the, um, this parameter, it's the mean, intercept mean, I mean in the growth model, has a, a much wider spread uh, from, uh, from one to three, whereas in, in reality, uh, it, it should spread around this value one or around this value three. So you get totally distorted parameter estimates if you're not aware of this label switching. And with one chain, you can easily see that there's label switching if you look at a, a key parameter. Uh, in this case, the two classes, trajectory classes, are distinguished to a large extent by the uh, intercept growth factor. So what you do here then is add a parameter constraint to keep track, to keep this switching from happening. And you have an, a label introduced in the model command on slide 85. M, the mean for class one for I, for the intercept factor, and the mean for class two. You give them starting values here uh, to keep, well, that's not necessary, but you can do that if you want to, a high and a low. And then, you uh, say, you add model constraint, and you say that you want the mean for class one to be greater than the mean for class two. So you put in an in inequality constraint in the modeling. And then you will not have class one go and fluctuate down to be lower than the class two's mean. You will avoid the label switching, and you will get the correct parameter estimates. So it illustrates labeling of a key parameter here and uh, illustrates the inequality constraint. You, but also inequalities. Yeah. I guess not. So Linda's saying, well, we said that we could only use model constraint with new. Well, we can use it with the inequalities as well. But we don't have the full flexibility of, of all of the options in model constraint for base. Uh, an alternative way of keeping uh, the label switching from happening, which distorts the parameter estimates, is to uh, single out, is sort of in line with training data, singling out uh, individuals who have very typical uh, class membership and fixing that. But that's more complex than this. So label switching is an issue in mixture modeling that makes mixture modeling in base a little bit more difficult. You have to keep track of it not happening, and if it happens, you have to uh, uh, put constraints on the classes so the labels are well defined. It doesn't mean that you constrain the model, not at all. You don't constrain the model at all. You just avoid the flipping of the labels. And the label switching happens more often when the classes are less well distinguished. That is, the means are not so well separated between the classes, or, or the parameters that make a difference between classes are not so different. different. And it's more likely to happen uh, when you have small sample sizes. And of course, the most likely case is when you have small differences in parameters, 
between the classes and small sample size. But I managed to do quite a lot of uh, growth mixture modeling uh, without parameter constraint, uh, not seeing this label switching, so you don't see it all the time. For instance, I redid the uh, cohort one uh, aggression uh, growth mixture model that we've used a lot in, in this group in base. So um, let's look at slide 87 then. What this means that you can is that you can do this kind of analysis. Look at this. Boy, this is like Linda's model, right? You have uh, 9 times 8, 72 uh, variables. And you have 8 latent variables. So because these are categorical indicators, we will have eight-dimensional integration. And now we've added a mixture. So this is doable. A mixture growth model with multiple indicators is doable. Uh, that we've done that and uh, didn't see any evidence of, of uh, label switching. Doesn't mean that we want to encourage you to do all kinds of wild models here. But, uh, you know, particularly not if you're not used to um, latent variable modeling or M plus analysis, you should always start with small, small building blocks, building block being something like this, you know, and build it up. But you should know that, you should know that um, it is possible, technically possible, to go to these more complex models. Now, let's switch gears. After mixture, what comes after mixture in M plus sequences? Multi-level modeling, right? Like topic seven and eight. It, user's guide is organized that way too. There's an order here. And hopefully enough of you have um, experience with multi-level modeling. I'll tell you about it briefly here. On slide 89, you have multi-level regression with a random intercept. So you consider um, individuals i in clusters j. So for instance, uh, students in schools, students observed in schools. And you say, you say we focus on regression. So we want to regress their achievement on some background variable x. And the intercept is beta 0, and the slope is beta 1. And we have a residual. But both beta 0 and beta 1 could potentially vary across the schools. You can have different regression relationships in, in the different schools. Here we see then that uh, beta, the intercept, the beta zero, is uh, random. It has a mean gamma zero zero and the residual u, and the residual has a variation. So beta zero is a random intercept. For simplicity, we let the slope be fixed uh, in this case, just to illustrate uh, a simple uh, two-level regression model. So that's a standard model. The problem is that um, we often have uh, analysis, say in intervention studies, where we uh, enlist a rather small number of schools, small number of clusters. And we know from two-level analysis with maximum likelihood that um, parameter estimates and standard errors and chi-square test to model fit don't behave well when we have small number of clusters. We usually recommend like uh, 30 to 50 clusters for a good, a good behavior of all of those quantities. Uh, we can certainly um, go down to uh, say 20, but what if you only have 10 schools? What if uh, the power to detect your intervention is sufficient for 10 schools? But if you do 10 schools with maximum likelihood, this, the estimates are not going to behave well. So what do you do? Well, you know the answer. All right. This is where base shines. So let's take a, a, an example here. You have 10 schools, each with 50 students. And then the interclass correlation is a measure of um, how big the um, between school variation is relative to the total variation. So it's a measure of uh, deviation from independence of observations. Interclass correlation is a measure of the deviation from independence of observations. We don't have all observations independent 
when we have this kind of cluster sampling. We have correlated observations. And 0 0.10 is regarded as, although it looks little, it's regarded as a fairly large uh, uh, correlation, a fairly large deviation from independence, particularly when the cluster size is as high as 50. Uh, complex survey uh, statisticians talk about design effects, which essentially is a function of the product of the interclass correlation and, and the sample and the uh, cluster size. So 0 0.1 times 50, uh, that's, that's a large number, right? That's five, right? And design effects uh, greater than two already are, are, are noteworthy or, or big. So let's take a look at uh, an example of a data, analysis of a data, where we have a simple regression, um, y on x, uh, with a cluster uh, variable to, design, to, to designate cluster membership for these people, the schools. We do type equals two level analysis. That's our two level uh, notation. Estimator base now. And we have then a within level one equation. Le within is level one. We regress y on x. And we give the y residual variance a label w. And we give the, uh, we have the between level, which is level two. And what varies on level two is the intercept y. So this, this matches the uh, picture, the uh, formulas directly. So uh, y on x and the, uh, is here. And the uh, variance of the, the b y here is the residual variance for the, uh, that is the variance for the random intercept y. So y here is the variance for the intercept uh, beta zero, which is the same as the variance for the residual here. And the slope is not random. It could be random using the bar formulation in M plus, but it's not in this application. Here we're gonna have a prior for, a, um, for the B parameter, and I guess I should have 91 up here. The B parameter again is the um, between level variance. So we're gonna focus on the between level uh, quantities here. And we're gonna use, uh, you're gonna become intimately familiar, I predict, with the IG 0 .001, 0 comma 0.001 prior, or as it would look like in the literature, IG parenthesis epsilon comma epsilon, where epsilon is 0 0.001. This is the favorite variance parameter um, prior among windbugs people. It's the Spiegelhalter et al. prior that's recommended. So it's a prior that um, it gives you a prior notion of a small between, a relatively small between level variance. Uh, it, it is not very informative. It is uh, a beloved parameter for variance among Bayesians. Uh, we can also look at the ICC in the analysis, ICC being the between variance divided by the between plus within. This is the interclass correlation, and record that. And we do that now for, um, yeah, we get the within level estimates uh, and the usual uh, columns for that, but we're gonna focus on the between level estimate. And we have here then um, between level estimate for, uh, for a variance and for, for the between level uh, variance for the intercept and the uh, interclass correlation, 0.223 and 0.096. And here you have the 95% credibility interval. And in both cases, they do not cover zero. So here's what it looks like. If you look at the posterior distribution, which the median of which is 0.223, right? 0.223, yeah. So this uh, estimate here is the median, and the posterior distribution for the between level intercept variance is very skewed like that, very skewed. Certainly a normal uh, distribution assumed by ML is totally off, totally off. 
and the ICC, our new parameter that we derive from the two variance components, is also very skewed like this. So the 95% uh, credibility intervals are not going to be like uh, the 95% confidence intervals of maximum likelihood, certainly. So, and, and this happens then for variance, variance parameters and particularly for a um, small number of clusters. And the between level um, intercept variance is of course a measure of heterogeneity of schools. So it's an interesting measure in itself, or if you want to presented in the interclass correlation metric. It is also a descript, sort of a descriptive of school heterogeneity with respect to some kind of relationship between some y and some x. So it's an important quantity. Now if you did ML analysis on this, if you go to slide 98, you're going to get uh, incorrect or different estimates. So you have um, Slide, well, maybe I should do it easier like this. On the right, you have ML, and soon you will have on the left, base. So on the left is what we just looked at, slide 94, the base estimates for the between level uh, intercept variance and the ICC. Between level variance estimated at 0.223, this is base on slide 94, compared to slide 98, ML, 0.19, it's underestimated. And the interclass correlation, which is 0.096 here, but base is underestimated as 0.03 by ML. This is just one sample analysis, so what I did here was to do a um, simulation study. I did a simulation study with a small number of clusters to see what the quality is of base and ML. And this is in one of the papers. Simulation study in M plus. So you can simulate uh, for your own des designs that you are contemplating. And um, ML here, if you look at slide 101, ML uh, in the simulation study, Monte Carlo simulation study, we want to focus on the 95% coverage. That is, how good is the ML confidence interval? How often does it cover the true value? In 100 replications in the Monte Carlo study, it should cover the true value approximately 95% of the time. Well, it doesn't. It's 0 0.80, 0 0.81, whereas it should be 0 0.95. And the ICC is also off in coverage. So in a Monte Carlo study, we can demonstrate that ML doesn't work well with small number of clusters. Um, well, does base work well? Here are the base priors that we work with, the uh, Spiegelhalter prior here and another prior. Uh, I'm not going to talk about priors now because we are, um, need the time for other things. So I do a Monte Carlo study for base now on slide 103, where we know what the true values are. We have a model population with values that generate data. So the true between level variance on slide 103 is 0.222, and the ICC is 0 0.1. We do two level base, and uh, we use, uh, here in the paper, I experiment with different priors, but here's the favorite Bayesian prior, which seems to work quite well, actually. And what you're looking at, then, on slide 105 are the base results in the Monte Carlo study with what I call the Spiegelhalter um, Winbugs prior. And you should look at the 95% coverage column and that is pretty close to 90.95, and likewise for the intra-class correlation. And the point estimates are close to the spot, on the spot as well. So it, there is a distinct difference between these coverage values for ML on slide 101 and these coverage values for base on slide 105. 
So it seems like Bayes wins when you have two-level data with small number of clusters. And this is uh, known in the literature uh, for, um, let's see, uh, there's an excellent paper here by uh, Bill Brown of the ML Win Group and David Draper, a, a statistician who uh, now is uh, UC Davis, I think, UC Santa Cruz maybe. Um, Bill Brown is in Bristol. And they did a nice paper in the, new, now you have to look for new journals, Bayesian Analysis 2006, Comparison of Bayesian and Likelihood-Based Methods for Fitting Multilevel Models. This is uh, a nice overview <coughs> with the simulations and discussions about how you should work with priors for two-level models and some real data analysis as well by two very experienced, uh, practically oriented Bayesian statisticians. And we have, like I said, dabbled in this too. So th this simulation study that I just presented is in uh, my little paper here. And it's also uh, with some other settings in the Asperojo and Mutian uh, paper, which is also on the website. And both of them have M plus scripts and data, which means that I didn't, I didn't take the time to show how to do a Monte Carlo study here. We've done that else, elsewhere in our, in our training session sequence. But in principle, um, it is uh, quite feasible for you to do Bayesian simulation studies to determine quality of uh, estimation and power. I mean, if you want to, and what corresponds to power in a frequentist framework. So, um, uh, which chapter in the user's guide talks about uh, Monte Carlo simulations now? 19, I think. Well, chapter 10 is the examples, I think, and then 19 it, is... Is it 12? Oh, yeah, it comes after the new chapter 11. So 12 and Chapter 18, 12 uh, talks about Monte Carlo simulations in M+. And there's really nothing special about Bayesian uh, Monte Carlo studies uh, as it's implemented in M+. So, um, you made it to the right place. I think we are at the right place for uh, questions and the lunch break, folks. And then we, are, we have positioned ourselves in a good spot for being able to um, finish uh, all of what we want to talk about by around 3 to 3.30, I predict. Okay. Yes. Uh, let's suppose you're in a situation where your prior is so diffuse uh, that you don't even know you don't know what distribution it might follow. You, know, you just put normal and made some guesses about the normal variance, but you don't want to be there, and so you decide that while well, I don't have an informed prior, there are experts that I could query. Who could help me with an informed prior? And so what I'll do is uh, I'll take the uh, various uh, parameter values and maybe I uh, assess their distribution. So now they give me a distribution of potential uh, parameter estimates. A distribution over these experts. Yes. So <laughs> is is uh, uh, M plus capable of? of using that, in other words, uh, putting the distribution in directly, as opposed to specifying more, uh, you know, that the parameter estimates follow some normal distribution with a mean and variance. Uh, no. It, I, right now, what you have to do is you have to choose a distribution, uh, like normal or log normal, with uh, the, the, uh, the requisite parameters for that, the mean and variance, for instance. So if your if your team of experts gives you a range of values, what, what I would do is I would create a little histogram for that, and then try to um, see what distribution that has. Maybe it looks pretty normal, or maybe it looks non log normal, or maybe it looks like an inverse gamma with a little tail. Okay, so that's that's what you would have to do. Yeah. My second question is uh, uh, in this most recent example you gave. Uh, if you have uh, a, a small number of clusters and, say, very high intra-class correlation, 
uh, that would suggest to me that, that you uh, will overestimate your effective sample size. You don't have as much sample size as you think because there's right. non independence. Right. Am I right on this? Yeah. Okay. Uh, does the Bayesian approach then, uh, uh, under those conditions, uh, weight less the data and might give greater weight to the prior in this case because it's saying, you know, we've got a sample of, say, a thousand observations total, but we really don't have a thousand independent. Right. But that's what uh, using type equals two level takes care of that, not Bayesian estimation, right? Right. So, so when you use type equals two level, you use that because you have data that are not independent. So the clustering, the non-independence of observations due to clustering, is modeled using equals either type equals complex or type equals two level. And the Bayesian analysis is just an estimator. It doesn't, um, it, it estimates a multi-level model. It's the model that takes the non-independence into account. And, and just to add to that, um, in this example, you had 10 clusters with 50 students per cluster. So that's what, um, 500 observations? Mm -hmm. <laughs> And uh, so I think the comment is that we don't have really 500 independent observations. We really have more like, we, when we don't have only 10 observations, but I think the answer may be uh, perhaps closer to 10 than to 500. And, and that depends on the interclass correlation. So it's true that with small number of clusters, uh, small number of clusters, and a small number of schools in this case, and a high interclass correlation, the sample size is very limited, and therefore uh, priors will play a bigger role. That's true. Okay. Yeah. How low can you go in terms of the number of clusters using the Bayesian approach for multi-level modeling? What would your lower limit be for the number of clusters? Um, I wish I had uh, paid attention when I read that article. <laughs> <laughs> there is a lower limit. I forget how it is defined. But I think you can get away with five. I can't remember what it, what it depends on. I would have to, that, that brown and gray for uh, reference would be a good one. Um, but I think you can get, that, get down to five and still get uh, reasonable results. So that's an interesting, I mean, that's always been the Achilles heel in many studies, right? That you have too few clusters. You know that your data are multi-level, but you have such few clusters. Okay, more questions. Yes? Um, slides 60 and 72. Slides 60 and 72. Um, it's first for the example 72. Um, why the output is new on STDY? Did you not want to make it STDY? Oh, for okay. the Oh, here? Yeah. Why I have STDY? Yeah. Is it STDY? I didn't want to standardize with respect to the x's because they are all uh, binary. Oh. And it doesn't mean much if you have standard deviation. You want to go from male to female. Yeah, that's all. I'll work for that. Good. We want to cover all the bases here. So are, are you... <clears throat> well, should we come back a little early from lunch? We, we can do that. Yeah. Well, it's almost called anyway. Well, okay, so if there's no more questions, then we should come back no later than 1.30, though, should we start? Yeah, no later than 1.30. Uh, pretty much around that. <laughs> <laughs>